after the midterm, uh, they, there was no serious objection to their day other than it's very close to other midterms. If I shift it, it's going to be close to other midterms. Uh, I know it's close to lab, but if I shift it to another week later, it's going to still be close to lab. Uh, if I shift it to Wednesday, we have one other suggestion to the of mechanical. So unfortunately, that is the 22nd of October at 7 to 10 p.m. Um, You'll see how the timing goes. It's not going to be a three-hour paper. Um, I've blocked all three hours, but I'm happy to just, I mean, I'm, I'm almost at the point where I, most of my testing exam is almost unlimited time. So if you need more time, you can have more time. Timing is an issue. I know that both are very close to other lands and other areas, but that's, that's fourth year, and that's just the time of the year as well, in terms of, unfortunately, it's the same. The topic for the midterm will be all the pure process economics material. So we would have finished the process economics by probably just up around Thanksgiving. And so we would then have at least two weeks after that to study and uh, sort of submit it just on economics, not in any of the new stuff that comes after that. What are we allowed to have? Anything. Okay. Except the laptop computer that has a phone, etc. We can bring our own. Phone right? notes, own papers, textbooks, a limited pile of paper. <laughs> <laughs> Just remember, the more you stuff to break, the harder it is to find material unless you can go into So, open book is actually um, a bit more work than you would have. Okay, let's just quickly talk about the project. The self-directed project uh, memo has been posted to the course website yesterday. This is the major piece of work for this course. The project has got two components. There's the written part, which is a, a strong, strong uh, factor in the grade. And then there's also an important part where you give a presentation to the class. So uh, the exact timing is about 15 minutes per group, 10 minutes of presentation, and 5 minutes of questions. This is an important part of the self-directed learning is that you can also convey what you, your group has learned. So it's a group presentation, your group prepares materials for the class, slides electronically, or any sort of material that you believe will be effective in conveying your, uh, your project to the class. And there's at least two weeks set aside where we have all the groups presenting. So 15 minutes per group times 19 groups, it's about six classroom periods that get used for that. And all that material will be examined. So everyone's uh, presentation uh, will be part of the, the final exam, uh, in the sense that the final exam will have less process economics, and then everything else that's come after that, including the, the self-directed learning projects, that focuses quite heavily on the exam. So, so it's an important part for everyone to learn from, from the other groups as well. The exact details of what the reports to length and presentations and so on, we'll, uh, I'll, I'll clear that up in, in a future class, uh, or in a future memo rather. The key point to remember now is that by Thursday I would like an indication from every group what area you would like to investigate. So this is not like the separations course where I've given you a list of defined notions to look at. This, this course is far more open-ended. If there's something that's really of interest to a number of people in the group, Please feel free to work on that. If you had a uh, knowledge of, of a process from a co-author, that could be useful, but please be careful with those sorts of projects. For one, there's often confidentiality agreements that prevent you from disclosing certain details to the class uh, that you need to be bound by ethically as an engineer. Secondly, it's just you in your group, and then you've got four other people perhaps that are depending on you to try and provide that sort of insight. So those projects, while they definitely give you an advantage as a person, they don't give your whole group an advantage. And further, the rest of the group may not be quite interested in that particular uh, piece of work that you've done. So sometimes those are not the best projects to, to look at, despite the fact that it, it might appear so, because you've got ready access to the information, you're intimately familiar with the flow sheet, perhaps from your co-op term, and uh, you understand the safety and troubleshooting issues around those processes. So there's just a bit of caution on that. Uh, not to dissuade you from working with outside companies, though. There are some companies in this area that are, have worked with previous groups before. One is, for example, uh, the Cadbury's plant up here by Cortinos. They've been very open to working with McMaster graduates before. 
but that's not something I can organize on your behalf. In fact, I don't know anyone at that point. So it would be entirely up to your group to go make an effort to find the right person for people and, and try and, and work, work that. So that's not something I can assist with. But something that you could work, also consider is the, um, the boiler house. So there's a number of flow sheets in the boiler house that could be done as, as possibilities. Uh, in previous years for this course, there's been always two or three groups that pick the same part of the boiler house. I'm going to attend with 19 groups. We can, we can get away with some, with, with some duplication, but I'm not going to generally allow more than two groups to do the same flow sheet. Uh, so, so I don't want six boiler house projects, for example. Um, the other alternative is, of course, to resort to many of the very good references that I've, I've put there in the memo. Um, there's the McKay textbook, that's a normal textbook on unit operations. It's been the standard textbook of chemical engineering. Uh, my God, since my dad studied chemical engineering, I've seen that textbook in the house since I've been growing up as a kid. So McKay is a standard MH textbook that's got filled with unit office and flow sheets of specific processes that would, would work quite well for this course. Uh, the Ullman set of encyclopedias, they're very comprehensive. Kirk Arthur encyclopedias likewise, and then Perry's may be less, less resourceful, but Perry's it would be good to give you order of magnitude estimates uh, for the types of uh, flow rates that go through these units. Uh, capital cost information in Perry's is very good. And then of course we'll learn some more capital cost information now, uh, coming up in the next few days. So the project will have, have an economics focus, obviously. You'll be looking at the economics of the flow sheet that you're studying. Estimating the capital cost requirements for that, operating costs, uh, what would be the sort of depreciation costs around those units, what would be the cost to install a new unit in that plant. Um, then we, now after Thanksgiving, we'll be moving on to the safety topic in this course, and actually I'll be having Dr. Marlin uh, come in and give a class or two on, on the safety topic, since he wrote this chapter in the in the course notes on that. I, I've asked him to come and talk with us on safety, so he'll be talking about that. But then in the project, we'll we want to see some of the safety aspects as well. That has an operability study that we've looked at uh, around this process. We are also going to look at troubleshooting in, uh, coming up shortly after that. So this is when things are going wrong in the process. How do we go about trying to, un uh, uh, to undo the problem or, or isolate the problem and identify it and then, then fix it up? So you'll be looking at that on your flow sheet as well. And then the next part, the final part of the course that we're going to learn about is process operability, um, starting up and shutting down the process. These are important things. Uh, that we don't really cover in any other course in ChemEdge. Uh, we always assume steady state, things are going quite smoothly, but we never think, how do we start these units up um, and shut them down as well? Especially when you've got a very tight integrated flow sheet with heat exchanges and feedback and recycle loops. How do you handle those sorts of things? So uh, it's, it's a great opportunity for you to uh, develop your skills as an engineer, to learn about a flow sheet that uh, may have always been interesting to you, but we've not had a chance to learn about it yet in our in, in, in this undergraduate curriculum that we teach. So this is a good opportunity for you uh, to work with your group and, and uh, get that get that learning. Okay. Any concerns so far about about that topic or about the project? a bit of legwork on your behalf if you do work with an outside company, if you if your group feels that this is not something you want to do, if you, uh, there's no penalty for using a textbook uh, as, as your basis for your flow sheet. So don't feel you have to work with a company, though the experience of working with a company may actually be uh, it will be fairly enriching for, for you and your group. Yes? Do we have to have the flow sheet right there, there just like the topic? No, just the topic. Uh, just and, and you would probably want to identify the broad boundaries of where you're going to look at. So my my aim with Thursday is that I've got a, a, a write-up from you, a paragraph or two from your group where there's agreement on what area you want to look at, and you define some boundaries. Don't say petroleum. The flow sheet for petrochem is, is is obviously not going to be uh, suitable for this course. It's too big. Similarly, if you just say, I would like to look at the distillation column that separates C6 from C7, that's, a, that's too small. So I'm looking for a reasonable size flow sheet that, that has a number of capital items. It's got troubleshooting and process operation issues that are going to be meaningful for you to look at. 
from a project perspective. So my, my feedback to you will be, this is okay, or this is too small, this is too big, or this might be inappropriate. So just the dates then, 27th of September is the selection. We'll finalize those things by, by next week. Uh, we'll start, 1st of October is the date that I'll have some feedback for you by. Then by the end of the month of October, we will have a formal meeting with myself and or the TA. Uh, so Alicia's going to be the main contact point for about half the groups and I'll be the contact point for the other half. Uh, I've chosen Alicia to do this because she's had some some industrial experience with, with these sorts of things. And so she's going to take uh, and lead, lead a number of groups. And I'll sit in actually with some of the meetings that she leads, but purely as an observer, she'll be uh, helping some groups and I'll be helping the other groups. That meeting is also part of your grades. We'll be looking at, have you set up a proper agenda? How is the chairman running the meeting? Those skills that are in tab two of your mind that uh, come into play over there. That, that meeting is, is, is a progress meeting. You should be about halfway with your project. Okay, so let's, let's just take a look at the timeline. First of October is where you get the final go ahead for your project. Thanksgiving comes and then we start looking at the safety issues in this course. That's when you start, should be starting to investigate the flow sheet, identifying the units, coming up with capital costs. And then you're gonna be learning new topics in this course and having to use it in your project in parallel. Okay, so we're going to be learning about safety issues as you need them for your project. By the end of October we would have covered safety and we would have started on process operability and so you should be also keeping up. Every time we learn a new topic in class you should be immediately applying it to your project. That would be the ideal case um, where you keep, you learn and learn. It's basically just in time learning which is uh, according to studies, on learning is one of the most effective ways to learn. You learn a topic just as you need it. Um, which is why, coincidentally, on the, in brackets here, is how I run the tutorials. Yesterday we learned some challenging new topics in the tutorials, and now today in class we're going to learn a bit more about it. So, so end of October, uh, beginning of November is where that progress meeting occurs. The second week in November there will be no classes for 4 a.m. Um, that gives you time to work on your project. Then the 20th of November to the end of November, the 20 to 30th of November is when those two weeks are blocked off for class presentations. So November is going to be a very open time for you in this in this course. Um, and then 3rd of December is when the projects are due as, in, as an electronic submission. Uh, we'll also then have our final class will uh, just be a wrap up for me to, to talk about the whole course and put it in perspective for you and talk about the final course. So those are just some of the timing issues there. Those dates are now posted on the on the 4N website calendar. Okay, just uh, one other other topic, uh, one other point to, to mention is that in assignment three, when, when we looked at yesterday, that last question when we were looking at the capital cost for starting a project up in Brazil. One piece of information was missing there, I've just added it to the website, you need to use the MARR of 15% for your MPD cash flow. So the question for assignment So please try to do at least the first two, three years of that question by hand, and then uh, you can plug it into a spreadsheet to finish up and calculate the MPVs. But the calculation flow that we're going to uh, cover in class today is something that you should be able to do by hand for the final exam. So what I thought to, to start off today was just to recap some of the topics from the tutorial yesterday. We'll look at, at some issues around depreciation. Uh, just to answer some of the final, final questions and details there. I'll then look at uh, NPVs with tax, NPVs with depreciation, and then we'll wrap up with slide 80 uh, in the course notes, which is that big profitability analysis spreadsheet that's in the course notes. That's going to help you answer question four and five. 
then in, in the class on Wednesday, on Thursday, we'll take up the next section, which is sensitivity analysis. So, just a, just a quick example then to introduce this uh, depreciation details that I want to investigate here. Um, we said. Depreciation was uh, the government of Canada, uh, the agencies calls it its capital cost allowance, CCA. If we had the purchase price of a capital unit of 10,000, uh, and then the salvage value is estimated at 3,000, over a lifetime and of five years. So that's our, our best estimate. Then we can we can show that for the straight line method that the depreciation rate we should be using is that formula given in those the difference between the purchase and the set the salvage price divided by the number of periods we, we plan to that we're using lowercase n, the number of years of the life that we expect to use the unit multiplied by one of the purchasing price. So in this example, that would be 14%, uh, 0.14. So if we were using the straight line depreciation method, we would depreciate our, our unit here by $14,000 per year. So i.e. Uh, $1,400. The amount of depreciation you take off every year is equal to the book value in the current year times that percentage. <coughs> so the amount VT changes from year to year. The reduction in the book value uh, changes from year to year. In fact, the, the dollar value of that depreciation increases since the book value is increased. And then simply the double defining is. time period multiplied by that increased rate. So in this case, it would be 42%. Yes? Um, for the declining method of DED, the book value, would you use the value from the previous thing to calculate the mean? OK, good point. Uh, the we'll, we'll, yes, you definitely do. You use the book value at the start of the period. So we can emphasize that by saying book value at the start of the period. And then we can write book value at the end of the period is book value at the start minus the depreciation you've written off. Now this is all good and well, but it's mostly academic because the reality is in Canada, 
we don't get to pick our depreciation rate like that. We don't get to pick E. The government tells us what E to use. Okay, so yesterday's tutorial was a little bit artificial in that sense. Um, the government also forces you to use the declining balance method in, in every category of depreciation except one, uh, where they allow straight line depreciation. So every class of, of, of good that's depreciating is forced to use the declining balance method. Double declining balance method is not used in Canada. My Canada revenue. We learn about these because they are appropriate if you were dealing with U.S. taxes. Uh, U.S. tax, uh, U.S. depreciation uses actually a blend of of this. Um, so, so this concept is is good to understand. The concept of uh, having a salvage value at the end is an important concept, but the actual application now is is quite different. So, there's a, the the number of differences that come into play. So let's just take note of them here. Based on what we've seen over here, the, the differences between the reality is one of the first things is we can only take 50% of ET in the first year. So if you if you purchased a new piece of equipment, that first year's depreciation ET that you calculate, um, the government will only allow you to write a part of it. So one, one way that you can use that to your advantage is obviously to purchase your piece of equipment and, and put it into operation close to your year end. So if you, my year runs from January to December, and I put an install and start this piece of equipment up for regular use, on the 20th of December, I can still write on 50% of the depreciation for the year. So that's, a, that's, that's allowed. The other thing that we have to realize is that we have to use E values given by the CRA. <coughs> so Canada Revenue Agency publishes a list of Classes so based on its class they publish a list of classes and based on the class we have to pick the, de the depreciation rate that is given by that category so we don't actually get to pick D like we calculated over here so the D values will be as low as 4% for some very long term pieces of, of capital expenditure D values tend to be much higher for uh, consume, more, almost consumable items like laptop computers and, and those types of things have a very short uh, life, and so the D value is much higher. So this concept that D is in proportion to 1 over N is still a good concept that we learn about here from the theoretical depreciation equation. In practice, though, we're forced to use uh, the D value given by the government. Uh, we have to use... method. There's one exception that I'll, I'll point out in a minute. And the other thing is you can only claim ET if equipment is is available for That's the government's terminology available for use. They clarify it with a few examples, but the main is if you're using it to generate income. Okay, so if you were running a restaurant and you bought fridges and stoves, that period of time that you're setting them up and getting going is not the period of time that you can claim depreciation. The moment you start operating your business and putting that equipment into you to generate revenues for your business, that's the point in time at which you can start claiming depreciation. So in your first year, the government of Canada only allows you to deduct 50% of the DT, and you have to prorate it for the period of time in the year that it was actually used. 
So there again is another way that you can make money. Uh, put your equipment, uh, or comes back to that previous point rather, I should say, uh, put your equipment into use to generate income just prior to your year end, and you can get your life back. So it sends times the fraction of the period of time that you're using. <coughs> when you say um, the year end is in the first year, can a company define their year end? Yes. So if you're a startup, I can just adjust those numbers to benefit me in taxes? Uh, if you're a startup, you choose your year, your starting and end of your year based on any, any criteria you like. Okay. Uh, I can pick it to be at any particular day. Uh, I would generally, you generally do use it at the end of the month. I think the government doesn't force you to use the end of the month, but you generally do use it at the end of the month. And I, for example, my year end is 1st of July. To, uh, sorry, 1st of July to the end of June. So as long as you tell them what it is, you can define it. But you can't change it after you uh, Yeah. After you don't want and so it doesn't really matter uh, when you you could start your company in December and choose your year to be July. Can you choose end? Like the lifetime of the equipment? No. So the government, let's take a look at that. That's a good question. Can you choose the period of time over which the equipment's uh, useful life is, which is end? No, you cannot. The government forces you to use a particular rate, D. And once they've set D, um, that equipment's just going to decline on the declining balance method. So they force you to use the declining method and they give you the D value. So once you fix those two, your equipment is simply depreciating and tending to zero. So here's my capital P dollars. That curves slope is dependent on that depreciation of E. It doesn't matter if my equipment lasts three years or five years or ten years. Um, it's, it's, it's immaterial. It's just the amount of depreciation I get to write on from year to year is going to be the less and less. So, just to, um, you, can, you can work through uh, and see that action, action quite, quite easily if you go to the government's website and, and, and look at their, their forms here. Yeah, I put it up. This is the form where you actually get to calculate your CCA or depreciation. So at the beginning of the year, you, you put your book value into the previous year. So undepreciated capital cost, that's UCC is, is their code for book value. So UCC is E. Book value at the start of the year, which is the same as the book value at the end of the year, plus the cost of new additions. Did you make major maintenance to it? Did you add, add equipment in this category? Uh, so you pick your class, so this is the class of laptop computers, you take your total book value of all laptop computers in your company at the start of the year. Any new laptop computers that you bought, minus proceeds of disposition, i.e. the value of the goods that you sold in that class. So if you sold any of your computers on the second hand market, and you got a certain dollar value for it, that salvage value, that goes in here. So this is basically X, this is P. UCC after additions and dispositions, so 2 plus 3 minus 4. So book value plus new purchases minus salvage value gets you your net new book value. This is your book value at the start of the year. Then there's adjustments. If you bought adjustment for current year edition times half the value in column 3 minus 4. So this is that's your 50% rule kicking in. Base amount is 5 minus 6. So take what you, the depreciation you thought you would have absorbed minus 50% of it. That's what's left over. That's, then you multiply that by the rates that you look up on tables. So 4%, 8%, 10%. I'll show you those in a minute. And then and then the final columns, 9 and 10, are once you multiply it by your rates, this is the key value that you want. CCA for the year, depreciation. So that's the, the dollar, your book value times the rate is the amount of depreciation you get to write off. You're going to add up all these depreciations from all the classes of equipment that you own. So depreciation on your buildings, depreciation on your, your capital equipment, depreciation on anything that is allowed to be depreciated. You add up one one item per row, add up all your depreciations, and that's what's going to reduce our amount of tax pay. And then the difference from column five minus nine, that's then your book value carried forward to the next year. So it's a very straightforward uh, calculation. 
that we've learned about, but you're just seeing it a, a bit more broken down step by step. Here. In fact, this is how I encourage you to set up your spreadsheets. You put your book out at the start of the year, new equipment brought in minus salvage multiplied by the rates to calculate your net book value afterwards. So great, don't try to do all your Excel calculations in one, one column or one uh, line. Uh, break it out into multiple steps to just to emphasize that because you're going to then take the sum of those depreciations then and carry that, uh, <coughs> sum them up and, and use that to reduce the tax paid. Okay, so let's take a look then at, um, just to quickly see some of those classes here. Remember that we, we just, I'll just, I'm not going to scroll down through all of them, but here's the different classes and those are the rates that CRA allows you to write off. Okay, so all these classes force you to use the declining balance method at that rate. The only class that is, does not have a declining balance method is class 29, which is a very exceptional period of time between 2007 and before 2012 to allow you to write off using the straight line method over two years. 25% in the first year, 50% in the second year, and 25% in the last year. That's actually straight line method over two years but you're only claiming half the first year and then you claim the other half, but, so it becomes a quarter then in, in the final year. This is the only time CRA has allowed a straight line method. All the other times you're forced to use declining balance at the rates that they specify. So we're heading then to that equation that we had up in the tutorial once class. Let's set it up again. And we'll take a look at an example. <coughs> the key, the, the number we're after is we want to calculate the cash flow in the end time period, which is an income in the end period minus its all expenses in the end period minus tax paid. So let's just take a look at an example where there's where we just have tax paid. I'm just going to focus on a very straightforward case where just to illustrate the effect of taxes. So you don't need to write this example down. Let's just pay attention here on the board and see what happens when we have taxes. Up to now, we've had all income minus all expenses. And then we've taken that, we've got no tax here. So to my net cash available to me is then 2,500. The present value of that is 2,500. The next year, I, I earned $3,000. I have $500 of expenses, net cash is $2,500, but if you decline that for a time value of money by using a rate of 10%, that gets me two two seven three. And then I proceed to that. If I use the tax rate of 30%, so let's say the equation here for tax paid in the end period is income minus Minus depreciation. So I'm going to create a word, I don't know if that exists, so it's just for depreciations to emphasize the sum of all depreciation on all items, so take the cumulative depreciation. Here in this example, we have no depreciation, and we're like purposely just ignoring depreciation for now. There's no uh, capital expenditures here. These are just regular expenses. So all income minus eligible expenses. Let's assume for this example that all these all expenses are only the eligible expenses allowed by the government. <coughs> if the tax rate then is added to this, if I go put a non-zero tax rate here, what should happen to my NPD? So I'm, I, tax is just another outflow of money that's going to a very particular person. So point, say 0.3%, so it's going from 17,000 down to 12,000. So the taxes have uh, that break even, uh, or sorry, not the break even, that additional profit then, 
that five thousand dollars of profit is lost revenue that's gone to the government instead of to me. So I've gone from seventeen thousand down to twelve thousand, representing that five thousand dollars in present day terms of profit that's gone to the government. So tax taxes are just another form of cash outflow that we haven't really considered up to just yesterday in the tutorial and then now today in the class. So that's how taxes affect NPV. Is they just form another outflow that we need to take care of. What happens in a year where your taxes and expenses exceed your income? What would you do in the spreadsheet? Your taxes and your and your expenses exceed your income. <coughs> Or you can just simple case if your expenses exceed your income. You don't pay tax for the for the years that you have expenses that exceed your income. Okay, so uh, let's just be clear here then tax paid in your Excel spreadsheet you can put the minimum on zero, comma, and then whatever the formula is that you're using for tax paid normally. Okay, so just to prevent yourselves from going to negative. Now, there is a subtlety here that we won't consider for this course, but the government allows you to carry your losses forward and backward. So you, if you've made a loss of $10,000, I can carry my loss backwards for three years, and I can carry that loss forward for 20 years. Okay, that's quite incredible. You, we don't have that as, as personal taxpayers, we can't do that. If you've spent all that you've earned, the government doesn't care. But the companies are, um, are entitled to carry their losses backwards and relieve prior years that they've made good profits. They can discount those profits by their losses backwards and forwards over a period of 23 years, three years back, 20 years forward. For our course, we will not go into that day detail. So in a year where you make uh, less money than you spend, please just simply put taxes at zero and you're not going to carry those losses forward and backwards. Okay, the question now is then, what is an eligible expense and what is all expenses? So all expenses is quite clear. Anything that, that, go, that you pay out, that that's goes into all expenses. But what do we mean by eligible expenses? Let's just talk about this term to make sure that we're correctly calculating that. Because the one thing, okay, and I've got a mistake up here, is that tax paid is income minus expense minus depreciation. Take that all together multiply it by the tax rate. Please correct that. Um, so we need to be quite clear on what eligible expenses are. Because obviously, if we make that term bigger and bigger, we're going to pay less in tax, which is uh, the government's not going to allow to do that. So let's, let's just look at eligible expenses. These are things. If you need to operate your business, salaries, costs of labor, utilities, startup costs. Okay, so if you're a new company, you have to buy a whole lot of, uh, of material and supplies just to get going. Those are those are expense. Um, and then I'll add here regular maintenance. For repairs. Repairs to your equipment that are from an ongoing nature, regular preventative maintenance that you have to do to your equipment. That's an eligible expense that you get to be done. that you're not allowed to deduct over here as eligible expenses. But capital expenses, we will sum them up and they will, they will form the book value. So your book value isn't just the net price that you pay to the supplier for the piece of equipment. Your book value is actually much greater than that. Uh, so capital expenses, obviously the equipment cost itself, 
that's the that's one item of this end, and in some cases is the greatest of them. But in many cases, your installation that can actually exceed your equipment cost, and the government allows you to add installation to the value of the cost of the equipment itself, and then that sum of the two forms the book value, which you then go and appreciate. Okay, so what we're after is here is this capital expenses is going to play into this term over here. So it's going to be used to calculate appreciation. Okay, so we're really, we must, we must be able to effectively calculate our capital expenses because that, it, the government will allow us to write it off but only at a fractional rate which is in the end depreciation. So equipment installation goes in there. Any of the design that you had to do for that, engineering, you may have had to pay outside people to design something for you that you don't normally do in house or uh, external fees, those go in there in shipping. You had to bring that big reactor from Germany over to Brazil. Any insurance costs? Do they go in there? Is insurance allowed? <coughs> do you think the government will allow you to run up the insurance with that? Yeah. No. Nope. Insurance is never, oh. never used here. Insurance always goes over here. Thank you. Shipping is allowed, but it's not insurance. <coughs> and then site, site preparation. So all of those serve to increase your book value. Or if you have to do a major maintenance, let's add that as well to the list, major maintenance. In the year that you're required to do this major maintenance, it might be the fifth, sixth year down the line, you would then boost your book value by this amount. Because you've now done major maintenance, it increases the book value of the, of the equipment. And then if you're using the declining balance method of 30%, now 30% of this newer, higher book value. Okay? So this is why maintenance factors in and adds into it. The government does not allow you to write off major maintenance as an expense, because then you write it down all in one year. Whereas the reality is that maintenance gets used as a useful line in multiple years, so you get to depreciate that. Do you add that all to the initial book value, or as they as they occur in the period that they occur? So that comes back to that diagram of the CRA that I had up on the board, where I recommend you do your spreadsheets in multiple columns. Have book value at the beginning of the period. Then add to the book value any new equipment that you've bought, installed, designed, shipped, etc. Subtract from it any equipment that you've sold, because that's going to decrease, decrease your book value. Then you multiply by your depreciation rate of 30% to calculate your book value at the end of the year. The book value at the end of the year gets carried forward on the, for, for the next cycle. Yeah? Um, if you're doing a straight line method, Okay, so the government doesn't allow us to use the straight line method. How about in an assignment? <laughs> you add it, it just bumps it up, but then in an assignment you can argue in two ways. You can say my new book value is greater, I should use a bigger depreciation, or you can say I'm just going to keep using the same depreciation. I you could, uh, prefer the, the first one, where you inflate your book value by the new amount, because that's, that's, that's closer to reality. Okay, so, okay, so what I going to do here is uh, just at this point, what I'll, I'll show up on the slides is just this slide 81. I know we have limited time. <laughs> so what I'll do is I'll, I'll create an EDF of this slide and put it up on the website because I've just added a few, a few notes. Yes, sir. Just a few questions. So when you say supply, are you talking about indirect costs, like printing paper, all that supplies, and then for all expenses, is that right? Where the capital would go, like your raw materials and things like that? Everything that goes, goes in there, yeah.
So what I'll do is I'll put this on the website. What I've added here is some clarification on what these different rows are. So this, this slide is, is probably the most important one to answer. You'll definitely need to see this for answering question four and five. Just uh, some corrections you must make. Uh, depreciation there is not a 10% year, it's 20% figure. So please fix that up. The thing to note about this slide is that there's two pieces of capital equipment that were purchased. There's one unit that was purchased in year zero at $5,000. Then there's another set of rows here for the unit purchased two years later. So they get depreciated at their own rate. So you take those depreciations and then add them up down here so they help with total depreciation. What I will post on the website is this slide, but then I'll also have uh, some of the equations then that says, for example, that G is equal to C plus E, just so you can see the formulas of the different rows. So it's no, no issue based on what we've got up here on the board um, and what we've learned in the tutorial yesterday. You should be able to uh, figure out how each of those rows are calculated anyway without me showing you the equations. But I, I will put that up on, on the course website. The other thing just to point out here is that if you did this NPV and you assumed there were no taxes, no depreciation, it was just a regular NPV like you learned up to Friday last week, you would have calculated a net profit in today's terms of 6,200. So taxes and then depreciation have pulled that down to about 3,000 dollars. The key, the key insight here is that taxes and depreciation definitely affect your NPV. They always pull you down. In terms of your DCFRR, they will always decrease your DCFRR as well. Okay, so that's what question four and five were about, just to see how, by how much that happens. Okay, so the next class on Thursday, we'll look at sensitivity where we start to change some of these numbers.